Luncheon gives me great pleasure right off the bat to introduce our Commodore, Ken Glidewell. Come on up, Ken. Carson, yes. All right, well, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming out and uh, having a good showing for our good friend, Mr. DeWitt. And, um, and first of all, I'd like to, uh, we have a special uh celebration of course I think all of you are aware of it and uh, it's being prepared back over in the corner Carson when you're ready there's a bit of a fire emergency <laughs> <laughs> did everyone turn the fire sprinklers off so if, if everyone would would join me in singing happy birthday to mr. duet happy, happy birthday, birthday to you I'm going to turn the mic back over to Ron, and, and let's enjoy this uh, great lunch and speaker today. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And Jimmy, take one cut, and then they'll take it back and cut it up to serve to everybody for dessert after uh, after lunch. Jim DeWitt, 90-year-old Jim DeWitt, is cutting the birthday cake right now as we speak. A little bit about future speakers. We've heard about that America's Boat Cup race. Well, the chairman of the America's Cup um, Hall of Fame will be here on May 20th, Steve Tashia, a good friend. He'll be likely sailing on Youngster that night for the Wednesday night races, and he'll be here to talk to all of us uh, on that day about the America's Cup Hall of Fame. Uh, May 13, Jack Griffin, editor of Cup Experience, will be here to talk all about how fast you know, AC-75s are. We've been looking at the videos of these. These are full-on monohull 75-footers that are foiling. Scary, scary, scary creatures. Fast as I'll get out. Um, the Marine, uh, the Moss Landing Marine Labs is sending Brian Ackerman here to talk to us in April. And also in April, uh, or also coming up, we'll have the uh, founder of the Sailing Science Center. He'll be here on March 25th to talk all about the Sailing Science Center, the brand new museum uh, for the Bay Area. Uh, Chuck Adams, who wrote the book, uh, on how they built the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, we'll be here to talk all about his book and that whole incredible adventure. I, a friend of mine um, wrote the slogan for Sausalito. They have a motto in Sausalito. Uh, Ron Berman wrote it, and the slogan is Sausalito. It's why they built the bridge. <laughs> well, we'll get to hear about the guy who wrote the book on the bridge. Um, uh, Will Stokely will be here in March to talk about joining the clipper ship around the world race you can you can uh, buy a berth on this and race uh, from one leg to another leg or on one of the legs uh, mikhail vinikoff those of you who went to the stag cruise this year remember the most memorable color ceremony in the history of the stag cruise instead of colors on saturday night uh happening where the military uh marched out and brought the flag down from the flagpole handicapped vets who'd lost one leg one arm one eye or combinations thereof uh, were in charge of it, and we had them 
uh, jump out of a helicopter at 3,500 feet and bring the flag down onto the island. It was an incredible, while we all sang, which takes two hours and two minutes and 40 seconds, we all sang the Star Spangled Banner to the SOT. So that was fun. Mikhail Venikoff, the founder of Ranger Road, he'll be here in March. Uh, Marie Bird, the commander of the San Francisco Port Coast Guard and Northern California Coast Guard, will be here on the 26th of February. Then uh, you've been reading about Bruce uh, Jennigan. He'll be here on March, on February 19th, to talk about the historic and daring raid of Jimmy Doolittle, uh, which right, happened right after we were attacked in Pearl Harbor. It was an amazing um, experience, and he will talk about how he believes that was the axial moment where we got up the courage to know we could have war on two coasts, which is pretty pretty heavy duty. And next week, John Kirschmer, many of you follow his blog around the world as he sails all around the world and writes about the promised challenges and freedom of sailing to the edge of time. He believes that when you go racing, as by the way, Pete Sutter said something very similar to these 30 years ago, when you go racing, you should not know where you're headed. The adventure of cruising should be that you left the port and figure out where you're going to go next and basically take the adventure full to heart. So John will be here to talk about that adventure. Now a little bit, and I mean a little bit, he's just kind of not a really tall person, so we're just going to be short uh, uh, intro to the most famous guy in the room. Um, when you think about people who go on to become great sailors, I often wonder when did they start? Because um, some people start real early in a, in a sailing family. Jimmy started at age 10 on a 19-foot acorn that his father built in the backyard. Learning the lesson of that, he went sailing for the first time, thus at age 10, sailed around and went sailing one time, and then his dad and brother sold the boat. <laughs> Jimmy was without a boat. Took him till age 19 to go sailing again, and he went sailing that time, just like Jimmy DeWitt, because he built his own boat. He built an El Toro in the basement, not in the backyard this time. And he went sailing in it, uh, and he raced three races in Lake Merritt. And each of those races that he raced in, he took dead F ing last, <laughs> not second to last, last. And he would come in and the guy who was coaching and kind of running the regatta said, Jim, Jim, you're going straight into the wind. And when you're coming up, when you can't, you have to go off at an angle. And he's trying to explain tacking to Jim and Jim said, no, no, I don't want to go at an angle. I want to go there. <laughs> he would go on, as we know, to be the first person from the West Coast to win the Mallory Cup, to become an incredibly uh, heralded uh, a painter and artist and America's Cup artist in residence. And now as a 90-year-old birthday party and presentation, he's going to tell us a little bit about what makes Jimmy tick? And we all ought to know this because he's, he's a life lesson for all of us. My inspiration, Jimmy and I sailed together uh, in the Masters years ago as crew, and then I raced with him as his crew. And he's a brilliant, obviously brilliant person and brilliant sailor. Please welcome Jimmy DeWitt. Ron, I knew that the shortest distance between two points was a straight line. So I went from the starting line to the next buoy. <laughs> and it, the wind was very shifty on Lake Merritt, and occasionally I'd be on the right tap. <laughs> so I finally got around the course, and everybody else had finished. And they'd had lunch, and they were coming out for their second race. But by the end of the season, I had tied for first place for season's champion. Oh, this is a, a 30 foot man that I built with Bill Chrysler. Yeah, this is a, can you hear me now? <laughs> 
this is a um, 30 foot man that we made at Bill Chrysler's shop. And um, along with him, we made six nine foot people. They were Elvis Presley, Marilyn Monroe, Chuck Berry, Buddy Holly, and two kids jitterbugging. They loved that period in our history in Japan and they all went to Japan. This guy had to get shipped on deck, on deck cargo on a big ship. The reason for this painting is that um, I didn't have pictures of all the events or, or any of the events. I didn't think I'd be up here and need pictures. So I just put pictures, some of my paintings. Um, I like this painting because it shows the motion and the action of this girl dancing. The Mallory Cup, um, Stuart Walker uh, was a great sailor and he was the regatta chairman. And jo Jocelyn Nash and Jake Von Heckeren uh, were my crew. So this is the first time a woman sailed on the North American Men's Sailing Championship. We always, well, we're, we were always in the lead, but we didn't win every race, but we were always in the lead. And when the series was, oh, well, anyhow, this one guy that was always last, in the next to the last race or something, said, this guy's not gonna win this race. So I made the mistake of letting him get underneath me at the start. And he carried me away from the proper course. And he carried me out and the whole fleet got way out ahead, way out ahead. So I finally, after the, for about, till the next last, next to the last leg or the last leg, I got away from him. And now the whole fleet, it was in light air, trying to finish in the light current. And they couldn't get up to the finish line. They couldn't finish. They were all hanging around the finish line. And so I said, okay, crew, cross your fingers. So we went now the proper way up, way upwind, and then came down with the wind and the current. Now let's hope they stick around for a while. And as we got close to the finish line, I put the boat on the closest point of sail, a close reach. I got some momentum just as we, the bow slid across the outside of the finish line. And with that momentum, shot the bow up across the finish line, I was first to finish. <laughs> And I think that guy that carried me off the course is still out there trying to figure out how to finish. Oh, I put this, it's a, a lot of these pictures, you know, you're just gonna have to look at some of my paintings. But they're a lot more pleasant than having to look at me. So <clears throat> dogs and kids are made for each other. The story, okay, <laughs> coming home from art school. Um, my two buddies wanted me to make them some sales. I had been a sale maker before. And I said, okay, so I read the rules. And I read the rules and I said, oh, you know, they forgot to mention this or that. So I took the bottom or the middle bottom that and, and moved it way up high moved the top batten to a little, the little space that was left between them. And then the bottom batten was way down there all by itself. So I had moved the roach way up high, uh, figuring that I was pretty sure the wind was heavier aloft than it is next to the wire. The friction of the water slowed the, the air down. So, 
Uh, oh, and then I designed my own little uh, little snipe burgee. It said that you had to have a, a snipe on the on the thing. So I made a little chicken shit snipe. And he was had little short wings, and he had his feet out in front of him, and he was a cute little chicken shit snipe. So I put the snipe on the sail, just like the rules said. Well, they went down to the LA Midwinters and came in first and second. From then on, the whole world, Europe and everywhere, told people exactly where their batten should be. <laughs> That's a shit disturber. <laughs> okay, what's next? Oh, this is uh, another invention of mine. It's the umbilical cord. Uh, it's not in this picture, but anyhow, there's the picture. The umbilical cord was a cord I put in the middle of the sail so that when you let the halyard go and pulled the sail, you pulled half as much as you had to pull if you were pulling the whole sail in. And um, I was going into the leeward mark. I had it on my little sandpiper, my little boat that I had built. And the guy had position on me going into the leeward mark. And he was waiting and waiting and waiting for, for me to drop my spinnaker, but I didn't. And so he finally started to drop his spinnaker. So as long as my crew held the weather clue and didn't let it go, we could go to weather forever with the spinnaker just hanging alongside the boat and pull it on board. So by the, he dropped his spinnaker, then we got ahead, went around the mark, and we were on the wind going to weather as he approached the mark. And he sat there in slack-jawed amazement trying to figure out what the hell happened here. So, so and, and then I had uh, people from all over trying to show, show him how to do this umbilical cord drop. And uh, even had Lowell North ask me how to do it before he went to an America's Cup race. Let's see, what's next? I, you know, I got a cheat sheet here that reminds me what to talk about. I wish I had this when I went to school. <laughs> oh, this was fun. I, I um, was over early. I, my wife said it was a Lipton cup. And... Uh, People say you're not really getting a good start if you're not over early occasionally. Well, I was very seldom over early, but this race I was. So I had to do my circles and all the fleet took off and they were going up and at Anita up there, they were, is that Anita, is that what it's called? Yeah. And then they would tack in shore on a flood and tack back and forth, back and forth against the current and uh, get up to Chrissy Field. I don't call it Black Holler. Black Holler and I didn't get along. So it's Chrissy Field. <clears throat> and uh, just as we were about to tack inside of, to do our tacking in shore and follow all the boats, I noticed that we were making trees on the shore ahead of me. I said, well, wait a minute, hang on, hang on, don't let it go. I think we're laying Chrissy. They said, what are you talking about? I said, well, look up there. We're laying Chrissy. We had a current that was moving us out into the bay. We didn't need to do all that tacking in, in, inside. So we kept going, I said, Hold, cross your fingers, and it held, and we went all the way up, and we finished around Chrissy first, and went on and won the race. So you got to pay attention, look around, don't do things just because it was habit. What's next? 
Oh, I don't have any presenter's notes. That's that's what the race was, huh? The a Lipton Cup race. Well, we won a lot of those. I even even when uh, I couldn't race my boat, somebody else would race my boat and win the Lipton Cup. So we won it four, five, or six times in a row. Oh, and then Bob Klein decided that was enough of that. He wanted his son. My wife just tells me to shut up. <laughs> My wife, my, this is an interesting story. My wife, my wife tells, uh, never mind your wife. Um, so Bob Klein wanted his son to race. So, okay. So the St. Francis asked me if I would race for them. Well, I raced for them and we won. And then the Lipton Cup came over to the St. Francis. Then we had the fire and the Lipton Cup was destroyed. So anyhow, that's what happened to it. Sorry, Sally, I told the story. <laughs> I don't know what Lulu is doing here all by itself, but, oh, that's the next slide. Here it is. <laughs> Don Monica's Lulu. And uh, we, we tried the hardest, we did a video of the, production and the making of this and uh, it was it somehow is it still around anywhere Don We're gonna show the video later. oh oh okay I've got to keep going okay okay oh you most of you know where this is this is uh, the church up in San Rafael and uh, I took a little liberty with the colors and the stuff. I, I do that, I'm kind of crazy about color. Oh, I got to tell you a story about this. The wallet and my comb. I, uh, I was sailing out here in extremely light air and, and we had the spinnaker up and the wind was strange coming out of the north and so we had the boat heeled way over and I had my butt over on the rail and it pushed my comb and my wallet out of my back pocket and the surface tension of the water kept them floating. But I couldn't reach back in time to get them and I was training swimming at the time so I said to the crew, do you mind if I swim back there and get my comb and my wallet? And they looked like me, I was crazy. But so anyhow, I dropped my shorts, my pants, and I kept my shorts on and, and uh, my shirt and jacket and everything off. And then I stood on the transom and dove off of it. Well, I pushed the boat further ahead. <laughs> <laughs> And going back and getting my wallet and comb was easy. So I just tucked them into my shorts and tried to swim back to the boat. Now it was hard work. I had to swim hard to get back to it. And they pulled me aboard. And all the boats, we were in the lead at the time, all the boats, what's going on up there? What's he doing? And so we, I got back in the boat and we went on and went around Chrissy and came down and finished first. And they all tried to, they all pulled out their rule books to find out what rule I had uh, broken. Well, you've got to, if you go off the boat, you got to get back on it on the same leg that you were on. Well, I was on the same leg. So they were really disappointed. They couldn't throw me out, but we, we won. Yay. Okay, portraits are one of my favorite things to paint. I really love painting. And that sly fox over there, Martin McNair is in the audience here somewhere. There he is. And uh, 
there's uh, another happy couple. Are they maybe here, Sally? Are they here? They're not here. Okay. There's Martin. And, uh, oh, here, now this is an interesting story. Uh-oh, where'd you go? <laughs> this is um, Foxy. How many of you know who Foxy is? Look at that. Look at all the people that have been to the Bur British Virgin Islands. Foxy says, don't you ever call me an Afro-American. Why, Foxy? Because I'm British. I'm not an American. He lived on the British Virgin Islands. And uh, this painting he has, and the queen knighted him or something. He gave him some fancy award and he, so. Oh, Southern Ocean Racing Conference. I was, um, I thought I could do a better job on uh, the Mona Lisa. I just fix, fixed her up a little bit. Uh, uh, the SORC, we, uh, with Fuller Callaway, we went out and there was a good sailor on board from, from uh, Belvedere or Tiburon. And I he was the only one that knew what was going on besides me. And Fuller didn't, he always had to have somebody to help him. And uh, we got on the uh, outer banks of the Grand Bahamas or something. And the people on the island said, don't ever try to go over the top of the reef at night because you can't see the rocks, you won't know what's going on. Well, Fuller was determined. He had, well, he had already put a beautiful schooner on the rocks and destroyed it. And uh, he was married to a beautiful actress's daughter for a while and she left him. He tried to commit suicide, so. We thought maybe he was trying to commit suicide going over that thing in the middle of the night. So anyhow, I, I timed it. And by the time we, we'd been going long enough, I figured, okay, I think we're, we've made it. And it was a dark night, but it was blowing like hell out of the north. And we had to strap ourselves in at the helm because the solid water would wash us right out from underneath the home. And uh, his girlfriend would sit down below and scream and yell and, oh, and the dinghy blew overboard. And the forward hatch kept blowing open. And I said, go down and close it, go down and close it. Finally, it happened three or four times. Why don't you close it? He says, well, the hatch is broken. I said, here, aim the boat and keep the compass here and uh, I went down below and got a gasket and tied it down. So that took care of that problem. Anyhow, we survived, we got back to Miami. That was my Southern Ocean racing, one of my Southern Ocean racing experiences. Oh, less is more, this is, I uh, don't ever buy paint that says flesh tone. Look at the people on each side of you. Neither one of them have the same flesh tone that you do. So um, this girl certainly doesn't. Uh, I was walking down the beach to take a picture of something and I noticed this girl rolling over and I swooped my camera around and took a picture. I missed her foot, but who, who wants to look at her foot? So once again, crazy about color, I just put a bunch of color. And look at her hands. See, I don't describe her hands at all, but you know those are hands. It's so that's part of the less is more situation. The reason for this pace, I'm supposed to tell you. 
Oh, it's the, it's the only Art Deco I've been told west of the Mississippi. Okay, here. Dean Treadway had me do a, on Sweet Ecole, uh, paint these shirts for his crew. And you can see the front and the back of these shirts. One of the crew actually took it home and had it framed and has it hanging on their wall. Sweet Ecole, and they won the race and they won the, the best something for their, for their shirts. <laughs> this is the 19 foot sloop that my father built in the backyard, designed and built in the backyard. And I, uh, I saw it sitting at Moss Landing out in the weeds and I took a picture of it. And when I got home, I took a little artistic license and changed its setting and, and did this painting of the boat that my dad had built. They built about nine of them, I think. They had a little class on the bay here for a while. Oh, this is a, this one. We bought a dog. And so I started painting dogs. I thought, oh, a lot of people like dog, more people with dogs than sailboats. In fact, people with sailboats might have dogs. So I started painting a lot of dogs. And uh, I even have a dog here in my bolo tie. This is, when, I'm, when I don't have a commission, I just do. So these are three different kinds of boats, power boat, sailboat, and an old square rigger. Um, my wife says reasons for these paintings, because I had something to do. Here's, here's a little perspective lesson. This is uh, atmospheric profess, uh, perspective. Things in the background get far away and missed, and in front, they get dark and bright. And in all three of these pictures, what happened? There it comes. That was spooky. Um, all three of these pictures, you can, uh, you can see the atmospheric perspective. Thirty-three foot aluminum sloop I designed and had built at Kettenberg's. We raced it in the Buckner race, and a wave threw us so high that we're airborne, and we came back down. It was blowing sixty-eight at Bodega Head. And on the way home, it must have been blowing harder at Point Reyes because it sticks further out in the ocean. And uh, it was a great little boat. We won a lot of races with it. Uh, we would go boat for boat with Yucca. Yucca, I don't know how long Yucca was, but we were only 33 foot. Oh, yeah, it's a lot bigger. And uh, Oh, I know. On our way up there and all the wind, it's time. I can't tell you about what happened on the way up there. <laughs> My wife cut me off. Anyhow, it's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you.
Can you hear me? Welcome again to our Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Our guest speaker today is none other than the world famous yachtsman, yacht sailmaker, and artist, Jimmy DeWitt. Welcome, Jimmy. <laughs> so, Jimmy, um, we've learned lots about sailing by watching you and those of us, some of us who've sailed with you over the years. But tell us, when did you first start drawing and or painting? About the same time I started sailing. I, um, in school, to keep us off the street in the summer, they had us make paddles for our paddle handball cart. And so I drew a sailboat that my dad was building in the backyard. And uh, everybody wanted me to draw a sailboat for them and we would burn it into our paddle. So that was my first command performance was probably when I was five or six or seven, I don't know. A little and, guy. and when you just started painting, that's drawing. What about painting? <laughs> oh, oh, well, you know, I went uh, in Oakland. I wasn't a student. I was dyslectic. And uh, when in that time, they thought if you're dyslectic, you're either stupid or lazy. Or they both. didn't even know what dyslexia was. So it wasn't, I wasn't halfway through life before I realized that what dyslexia was. And then when I heard that Einstein was dyslectic, I said, oh boy, I'm in a good crowd. <laughs> my, my wife calls it gifted with dyslexia. <laughs> so anyhow, I will. So for when you start painting, when did you pick up a painting? Oh, oh yeah, my teacher in high school, my last. Which high school? Oakland High. Uh, had me in a in a art class, and the teacher was a PE teacher who was teaching the art class, and I did a can, and I had pointy edges on the ellipse, and that's a no no. But he didn't know it, and he thought I was great, gave me an A, and because of that, my mom sent me to art school. She so said, "Well, here's something my kid can do. He got an A in art." So I went to art school, and when I got in art school, I realized that that teacher didn't know how to draw an ellipse. But <laughs> it was it was because of that I got went into art school, and then I started painting. And uh, somehow it was one of the things I was pretty good at. And uh, so I I loved art school, and I I was there with the guys that came back from World War II. And so that was tough competition, but I could handle them. And I was just a kid. So anyhow, I there's just a few things I'm good at. And one is sailing and one is painting. So at least I can do something. So to show everybody uh, a bit of Jim's technique, we've seen these incredibly uh, cool photographs they are accurate sailing in sailing terms we know that's not easy people who don't know how to sail can't really paint cool sailing photographs um, and they're to scale at the same time so we're going to show you a video um, in fact with the subject who's in the room a painting done for him uh, uh, that shows Jimmy's uh, projection method so Sally if you'll cue the video hit the button on the Got it? Go ahead. You put us on the screen, this PC on the screen, please. Okay. That's a picture of youngster, not that. It always happens. <laughs> it's not a Wednesday show if something like this doesn't happen. Right. Tell us another story. Wait, wait, did you start with oil painting and then go to acrylic? When did you go to acrylic? No, I, well, I did some acrylic, but I don't like it because if it dries on your brush, you've ruined your brush. And I'm lazy, so I didn't clean my brushes often enough. But uh, I sculpt, 
did I tell you about the 30 foot man, Bill, yeah. Bill Chrysler? Tell us that story. That's I already told it. <laughs> Ron wants me to fill, but he's, I got to say something. Bill. You know, everybody in life has a story. So Ron, you can just get anybody to come up here and tell their story. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I've read, I've painted cars, horses, dogs, kids, kids. There's a, there's a little kittle I painted back there, my great grandchild. Hey! <laughs> Don Delzell, oh, Del, okay, Don Delzell. How many of you knew Don Delzell? Okay, well, Don Delzell had this great big boat and he had his whole crew before fires and earthquakes and everything out there. And they were rolling for a drink. And I said, uh, oh, I walked by. And he said, Jim, come on over here. And, and uh, we're rolling for a drink. And, and uh, you know, there's a bunch of us you're probably not going to lose. And whoever loses has to... Uh, by the round and get on the floor and walk around like a dog. So I said, well, the odds are it's not gonna be me. So I joined him. Well, sure enough, I lost. <laughs> and I had to buy the round and then I got down on the floor and I walked on my hands and knees like a dog and I went over to Don Dalzell and lifted my leg. <laughs> He, he loved to pay, be a painter and paint sailboats. And I, th I think his home was destroyed in the fire in Piedmont, wasn't it? Or, yeah. And, uh, oh, he had a lot of lo lovely things that were lost. But he, he wanted me to show him how to draw a straight line. And I very seldom show a straight line. And if you look, on most of my paintings, I don't even put shrouds. I know all that stuff it just gets in the way. And you don't miss it when, you, when you're looking at the painting. So anyhow, I showed him how to take a triangular ruler and hold it on edge and then draw the, the paintbrush alongside it and get a straight line. And uh, he liked that. I, Don was a wonderful, I love that man. He'd take his family cruising and uh, what a lo lovely childhood the kids had. Yeah, they're all nodding their head over there. <laughs> okay, so we actually have a video. Jimmy, if you go to YouTube and you look at DeWitt, you'll see that there are many videos about Jim and painting. And one of Jim's fun sayings is, claim your mistakes. So, um, Sally, let's see that video of Jimmy saying this. Eric, put us up. There we go. There we go. Sound, Eric. Hang on. And then she got a job so modeling for to show you. She was a Playboy centerfold at one time. And she said, well, what the heck? I'm only going to look like this for a little while. I might not wear a long line. I was told to accept your mistakes. There's some good mistakes and learn to recognize them hang on to it. So I'm going to show you a couple paintings I've done where the mistakes I recognize and they enhance the painting I've done. In this painting, I didn't like the way I had handled the grass in the foreground particularly. So I took a Viva paper towel 
and I was starting to scrub it out and get rid of it. So what I did when I picked up the paper towel, I said, whoa, that looks good. I think I'll just save that and claim it as my own. In this portrait painting I did, I was having trouble with that flag. I smeared some of the red paint up into the white, and it was it was bloody red. It was just and I was just trying to carefully go along and not touch the red and pull it up, but it was there. So I tried to scrub it out with my brush. I brought some more white in and tried to clean it out. And I wasn't accomplishing what I was really trying to do. And I stepped away and looked at what I was accomplishing. And I said, hey, that looks like that flag is moving. It's blowing in the breeze. I think I'll just leave that happy mistake and claim it as my own. So how often in a typical painting do you say to yourself, well, that, I like that mistake. I'm going to stay with that. Well, I don't make many mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> I accept that. Times, how often? <laughs> you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll actually go in and deliberately smear up an edge because when you look at something, you look at the person across the table from you. You don't see much of his ears or is any you're looking at his eyes or something and so you don't so i soften the edges a lot just to so it looks more real life you know you're only looking with in a painting you're looking with one eye when you're doing the painting but when you look at it you're look when you're observing something you've got two eyes so i i deliberately soften edges quite often. So Art Center, talk about Art Center. How did you how did you decide to go to art school? Well, I went to the California College of Arts and Crafts and um, it was when the GIs got out, and all the competition and everything. But then a, a friend of mine that I bought a Model B Ford from, the doors opened that way, I lost more girlfriends that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyhow, he uh, he had gone down to Art Center in L.A. and um, that was a professional art training school. The fellow there was told, and he was in New York. The guy, it's, it's, you better stop working so hard. So he came out here and started his own school. And to get in the school, you had to show samples of your work. And a lot of people didn't even, weren't even able to get in the school. Well, I had had some training in, in Oakland, so I, I got in fine. But a lot of times, halfway through the semester, the owner would go through the classes and he would say, uh, don't come back next semester. Hi. You're wasting your parents' money. So he didn't want anybody that wasn't going to make a name for his school. There were a lot uh, of people in New York that had gone to Art Center, and maybe a lot of them hadn't even graduated, but they had their own club of people that had gone to Art Center and were making a great career of their art. So that's... So, when you you, make, you started making sales, what year did you make your first sale? Nineteen. <laughs> I, we're told by the by a relative. Nineteen fifty nine. Pam says. Uh, Pam says fifty nine. Can you, you were, confirm? Are you enough? alive in fifty nine? <laughs> <laughs> she confirmed she was alive in fifty nine. <laughs> okay. So I guess it was 59. <laughs> <laughs> what sale was that? Who, who, who had the audacity to pick 
a sale maker named Jimmy DeWitt way back then at the beginning. How'd that happen? Who had the confidence in you? Oh, I can't remember that far back. Um, how'd you set up a shop? Well, you know, I first started building my own El Toro sale. Mm -hmm. And uh, at a Dacron? No, when I started, it was cotton. Linen? Cotton, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Linen? Egyptian, Egyptian cotton. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, and I would take tarred hemp and hand rope the hand rope the uh, edges rope. Uh -huh. of it. And when you came to the corner, you would bend the rope a little more, so you gathered it a little more. Oh, it was quite an art. And I'm left-handed, so it was so frustrating. I'd be perspiring. It would be squirting out of my forehead trying to trying to do this tough job with my left hand. And uh, so, I, I, but then they started putting rope on onto the Dacron and everything. The first sale I made was a uh, synthetic sale, was uh, nylon and it rained and the nylon stretched and the boom went down and hit the, <laughs> hit the transom. So that was the end of that. <laughs> then the other synthetics started to come out, the Dacron or I forget what it was called at the time. And so we, we could make better sales. And then once I stayed up all night for about three or four nights making a sale, and the next night I'd make another sale, I'd go down to Lake Merritt and I'd get somebody to sail against me. And I'd say, oh, that made it go a little faster. So then I'd make another one. And oh, that made it a little faster. And then finally I got to the point where it was, it was a pretty darn fast El Toro. And uh, that was the, I was my first customer. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I started so, sales. So, can we show that slide? So, this is a picture from, who can guess what year this is? That's right. This is 1964. We won the season championship that year. Who can guess where Jimmy DeWitt is in this picture? The orange shirt. Standing next to him, the kid in the white T-shirt. Yours truly. Far left is Shelly Miller, uh, Hank Jacobson from left to right. The tall guy is uh, Michael Delaney, whose memorial service we held here last year. And then Bob Hogan behind, behind me in the white T-shirt.